happened to be. Tory MP and Deputy Chairman of the COVID Recovery Group of MP Steve Baker. Such a pleasure to have you in. Such a pleasure to uh, meet one of, I think, an awful lot of my listeners' heroes in terms of the work you well, and that group kind. has done uh, to try and get us out of this, frankly, insanity. So much to talk about today. Let's go straight to it. Um, new Health Secretary, uh, Sajid Javid. Lots of very hopeful things being said yesterday. Time yeah. to learn to live with the virus. We should start returning to normal. Restrictions shouldn't last a moment longer than necessary. July the 19th, end of the line for lockdown. And he said it's going to be irreversible. There's no going back. Is this a clear dividing line between how the government used to view lockdowns and how they view them now? Well, we are definitely counting on him to make the hard decision when the time comes to set us free from these restrictions and, and let us get back to normal life. Absolutely. I'm not sure he actually changed the government's line to take. And in one particular point, he actually made things worse because uh, Matt Hancock told me step four wasn't in the regulations because it was freedom from the regulations. And that's not quite what Sajid and the Prime Minister have said. So we re wait to see what step four actually is. But if you're asking, do I think that Sajid Javid's heart is where mine is? Is his, is, is his mind where mine is? Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. He wants freedom. And, he was and speaking about getting out of lockdown sooner rather than later, as early as May last year, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, when I was. That's when I started talking about it. It's because Sajid and I both appreciate the other harms caused by lockdown. And I thank goodness today we've started seeing the Children's Commissioner talking about the harm to children. Mm. So I think we can expect Sajid to take a much broader picture of the cost of even the remaining restrictions. And, you know, his spirit is with us. So I, I, I am expecting Sajid to do great things. You're yes. optimistic. You're but optimistic. I'm also slightly cautious that policy hasn't strictly changed. No. And we have and, sort of been and here And even before. allowing the step four on, on 19th of July. And again, you know, how many times people say, well, we don't want to come out too early. January the 4th. For God's sake, we yeah. were in January the 4th, we went into lockdown. Lots of people saying, and, and people responding to me after a tweeting about uh, uh, the, going on the Freedom March, the anti-lockdown protest on Saturday. We're not in lockdown anymore. Lots of people seem to think that we've got enough freedom back. Why does it matter to you to get all of our freedoms back? Well, it matters to people whose livelihoods are being curtailed by the freedoms they, they've currently lost. So if you're in the travel industry, if you're an airline pilot, if you work if you're air crew generally, if you work at airports, you know, all those people in business travel, the leisure industry, people whose businesses rely on inbound tourism, uh, many hospitality venues not yet profitable. You know, these are, this is a big deal. And, you know, we still are under, are under this extraordinary requirement not to have more than six people indoors at home. I mean, it is an extraordinary requirement. Now, I don't often have more than six people indoors at home at See, my I house. I have, to, this <laughs> I, I have to admit, but in, 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 on quite a lot of these points, I'm standing up for things that I wouldn't do. You know, events and festivals, I'm not going to be going to any mm. nightclubs. Uh, but I do want nightclubs to be available. People need hope and joy in their lives. Because otherwise we'll end up with this hollowed out uh, and haunted society where you can't do the things which make life worth living. And, and I'm not willing to go there. And this is it. So much of the policy has been made. I and mean, the word caution is constantly used, isn't it, in these debates? That we must act with caution. We must be, you know, we must be cautious about the approach. But the caution is always about protecting us from COVID. That's the only aspect of the caution that is affected. It's, it's not about the, the, the costs of the damage to other health care. It's mm. certainly not about the economic costs and the mental health costs and, and, and the damage to uh, the fabric of our society, the way we interact with each other. There is a, there is a cost to everyone walking around wearing masks. There is a cost yeah. to that. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the first things that a dear sweet lady uh, complained to me about. A uh, lady well, old enough to just about remember the war, I think. But she was complaining to me about wearing a mask. She really didn't want to. It was a step too far and she found it awful. No doubt she still finds it awful. But this is why throughout we've been calling for a robust and proper cost-benefit analysis, taking into account quality-adjusted life years for the whole life of all of the measures, both the the coronavirus response and so in a sense the splash of policy and all the ripples. Mm. That's a term used by my new friend, Professor Paul Dolan at the LSE. He does great work on this. Mm. He's given me a checklist of about 20 different things we should all be thinking yeah. about. From, as you say, coronavirus, patients displaced by coronavirus, patients who don't go to hospital for tests and checks because they're trying to protect the NHS. Yeah. That's now a big deal yeah. uh, that's added to backlogs. But we, it's quite a complex optimization problem. I think we do have to face up to the reality that high levels of COVID patients mm. in hospital squeezed out other patients. Yeah. And people, people don't always uh, express that clearly. But where we are today, the great thing is the vaccine's working. Yeah. Vaccine take-up's been amazingly high. Yeah. It's broken the link between cases and well, deaths. Well, this is, why is the government, and particularly the former health secretary, Matt Hancock, why were they so wary of 
of uh, of enjoying the vaccine benefit and 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 you know the, the fact that we did roll out so much quicker it has been one of the great successes of this government I've, yeah. I've given plenty of criticism always credit where it's due but but we, we've not managed to you know just these sort of you know actually make, make use of that benefit. It's been excruciating, hasn't it? And I think it's a kind of tunnel vision. But that said, I, having spoken to scientists with whom I'm well acquainted, who I know to be broadly anti-lockdown, the point they make to me is that a small percentage of a very big number is still a big number. Mm. So if, if a tiny percentage of the under 30s, say, ended up in hospital, that's still potentially a large number that puts pressure on the NHS. And that was the best argument for this continuation. But here's the thing. Are we really going to allow our liberties, our normal capacity to socially mix the enormous impact on children, for example? Yeah. Is that really going to be allowed to be a tool of NHS management? It was one of the things exactly that I think we really definitely want to hear from the new health secretary, Sergio Javid, is, is that it is the job of the NHS to protect us, not the other way around. And, and a huge investment in the NHS to make sure that we don't have, as we've had for many years, um, you know, an, an, an NHS crisis every winter. We're going to have one this winter. You know that. I know that. Everyone knows that. What is being done to prepare for that, to make sure that we don't have the excuse that the NHS is going to be overwhelmed, therefore we have to curtail our freedoms uh, and our democracy to, 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 have, to protect the NHS. Are you aware that anything is actually being done to make well, sure that that capacity be, is being increased? I mean, the Nightingale hospitals have been dismantled, so... I am. It's a good opportunity to say thank you, actually, to a much neglected group of heroes of this crisis, which is NHS managers, if I may say so. Of course, I'm grateful to all NHS staff, but certainly in Buckinghamshire, our NHS management have you know, moved heaven and earth to make sure that our healthcare trust could deal with coronavirus patients and indeed continue with things like cancer diagnosis. So I'm really grateful to all of them. And yes, they are still looking at, you know, moving in heaven and earth to make sure the NHS is capable of dealing with the backlog. And they're naturally very nervous about a coronavirus third wave. But you know, this is one of those moments where we can't allow, <laughs> well, rather, a health secretary cannot allow himself to be guided entirely by people's fears yeah. of NHS capacity. He, it's the, the Secretary of State's job to take the broader view and to make sure that the, the general interest mm. of the public is pursued. And what do you make of the travel restrictions we're into now? We're now getting more um, restrictions imposed from the EU countries as well. We, we're basically not recognising the vaccine as having any value whatsoever in terms of enabling people to travel, uh, proposing less risk on themselves and other people. Uh, even the countries that have now gone onto the green list or the green watch list, including uh, um, the Balearic Islands as part of Spain and, they, and Malta, they are now asking uh, for a proof of two jabs or a PCR test. Um, Australia has gone into a lockdown effectively, mm. affecting some of that 80 percent of the population, including the whole of Sydney, because of a few cases of the Indian variant. Um, th we've been told again and again. But if we lock down soon, if we closed our borders, there well, was a choice. We could close our borders, have no yeah. travel, and then we'd be able to live freely and have be locked down free in this country. Do well, you think that was ever the, a, a likely trade off? Um, I don't think it was, no. I mean, what I would say is that people mustn't forget that the UK is a very, very diverse nation in a seat like Wickham. Uh, about 17% of my electors are British Asians. About 5% mm -hmm. of my constituents have family in the Caribbean. Yeah. You know, th th people need to travel to see friends and family. You know, Kashmir is not very far from Wickham, actually, and yeah. people need to be able to travel. So th 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 these travel restrictions have a very real and practical effect on British people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I'm very disappointed that things are as restricted as they are. Um, I, I think that people have constructed this narrative. If only we'd restricted our freedoms harder and faster, it would have worked. And I don't think the evidence bears it out. Mm. You know, Fraser Nelson and the Spectator have been very good at presenting in easy terms the data which shows that in every case, lockdown, the most, you know, the heaviest restrictions came in after the peak of infections. Yeah. So they can't possibly have caused us to go over the peak. So we're going to have to have really serious science done about all this stuff to get well, to the bottom of the A lot of this of is truth. going to come out in the public inquiry, but it may be a few too, few too many years too late uh, for certainly this winter and coming And winters. for this generation of school children yeah. who yeah. suffered these kinds of harms. They don't yeah. get those years it, back. But, I mean, it, it, but lockdown scepticism is growing, isn't it? I've definitely detected a move. Do you think one of the first things the government should do, particularly such a jab, is, um, is stop spending hundreds of millions of taxpayers' money on adverts to scare us and perhaps some adverts giving us more perhaps practical advice on how to handle coronavirus? Well, I absolutely do not want the government scaring the public. I think it's been quite wrong. 
I can see why the government was worried about the extent of vaccine take-up and, mm -hmm. and compliance. But gov the government's own advisers have told one book author, Laura Dodsworth, writing A State of Fear, yeah. that the techniques used were smacked of totalitarianism and were unethical. And that is, that, that, that is not acceptable. So the government shouldn't be spending so much money on advertising. And I would like, insofar as it does communicate with the public, them to really be setting out the facts before the public and saying, you, you choose. Here's where you can calculate your risk online. Yep. Calculate your risk. You've had both doses. You're meeting these people. Calculate your risk. Take personal responsibility. And let's actually become the kind of society we want to be, free and responsible mm -hmm. and taking care of other, others without the government clamping down Can I ask on you, us. Um, do you think it's, it's, it's just a coincidence that so many of those who are campaigning for the end of lockdown are also people who campaigned for Brexit? Because it, it seems to me, if you had a Venn diagram of those people in the public eye, it's remarkably overlapping to the extent I'd say it's just one circle. Well, maybe sometimes. I think that there are those of us who believe in freedom and we kind of point to freedom all the time or we try to. We have to be pragmatic. But that's the direction of travel for some of us. Yeah. And the world rotates around us sometimes. But, you know, for me, um, freedom is self-government, no more, no less, as somebody once said. And that's why I'm uh, against lockdowns and it's why I was in favour of leaving the EU. Uh, just finally, uh, Chris Whitty, this video, third time he's been sort of harangued and harassed in the street. A uh, bunch of yobbos grabbing him in, in, in a park in Westminster. Um, it looks like they just thought they were having fun. It doesn't look like it was any fun for Chris Whitty. Being grabbed around the neck awful. by a complete stranger is not Scary. a pleasant experience. Yeah. Very, very unpleasant. What Abs do you make of that? Absolutely appalling. I'm really, I'm shocked and, and, and horrified that it's happened. I mean, they do look like they were dr just being drunken and yobbish and probably thought they were having fun. But they mu mm. people must remember how they're perceived by others. People yeah. in public life, when accosted by others in the street, just do not know how it's going to work out. I thought mm. Chris Whitty handled himself impeccably. Didn't he? Well, he very but, classy. Yeah, yeah, of course he did. Um, and I understand that the police have have spoken to everybody involved and it's obviously a matter for the police mm. but I would implore everybody don't don't do this to yeah. public you figures. can disagree with someone on policy you don't yeah. doesn't you know, don't know there was no implication that they disagreed with him actually people will I think they recognized him off the telly yeah I think it's as simple as that yeah. people will approach me in the street with their camera running and ask me a few questions mm. and that's fine okay. but if something like that happens it's not on no indeed uh, just finally England v Germany tonight what's the scoreline oh I don't know come on England they've just got to win they've got to win after you know, all the time we've had you know we're all going to be rooting for them we deserve this one guys we, we really do one. yeah please <laughs> steve baker absolute pleasure to see you love Likewise. to see you in the studio came to recovery group deputy chairman and conservative mp steve baker thank you very much